The Final Fantasy series has been one of the most culturally influential and most popular video game franchises to ever exist. It was the series that many people fell in love with because it told a plethora of deep and thought-provoking stories with characters who were relatable. It was about the massive worlds that were filled to the brim with interesting lore. Final Fantasy quite literally shaped many of our childhoods and touched the hearts of many more. The success of this franchise made way for 15 mainline entries and over 30 spin-offs, with a 16th mainline entry releasing very soon. The series first dates back all the way to 1987 when Square Enix was just Square, and Hironobu Sakaguchi, the creator of Final Fantasy, was just starting out his career in the gaming industry. Back then, Square and Sakaguchi weren't doing too well financially and were on the brink of bankruptcy. The first Final Fantasy was their final attempt to stay afloat, because if the game didn't sell well, Sakaguchi would have to quit his career in the gaming industry and Square would have to file bankruptcy, hence the name Final Fantasy. On release, this game sold extremely well and would allow Square to produce even more Final Fantasies over the years. A lot of them seeing commercial and critical success like Final Fantasy 7 and Final Fantasy 10. But over the years, the gaming landscape has evolved and so did the Final Fantasy formula. Newer entries focus less and less on the turn-based aspect of it and lead more into the real-time action style of combat. This change would mark the beginning of Final Fantasy slowly losing its turn-based genre and to feature more real-time action combat in later entries. And that leads us to today with the most recent mainline title, Final Fantasy XV. <laughs> Final Fantasy XV is one of Square Enix's most divisive Final Fantasies to ever be released, alongside Final Fantasy XIII. The general reception of this game was that people either loved everything about it, or they absolutely hated it. And to be honest, I can see why a lot of people didn't like XV. The gameplay had a lot of jank in it that I'll discuss later, and a lot of the context of the story was removed from the game in order to be featured in other forms of media, including a VR game and a shitty mobile game. The game director Hajime Tabata would later dub this as the Final Fantasy XV Extended Universe. And I'm not really sure this is such a good idea for them to do this because the game makes a lot of references to the anime and movie that would just go over the heads of many players if they haven't watched either of these extra side contents. This kind of reminds me of the Destiny 1 situation where instead of putting all their lore in the game, they put it in these grimoire cards on the website, and well, the reception of that wasn't favorable, let's just say that. I know it's a bit different here, but I'm in the camp that video game lore should be in the video game, and any other media used to supplement that should be used to do exactly that, to supplement it not used as a replacement for the storytelling. And this is probably one of the reasons why this game went through such a troubled development cycle. But despite all the issues, there is something special about this game. It tried to tell an ambitiously large story and create a whole cast of multi-dimensional and memorable characters. Even though there were some problems with this here and there, I still really enjoyed the game. Now it's not a masterpiece by any standards, but it still manages to have what many games today are missing, a soul. Now this will be a full in-depth review of the entire game of Final Fantasy XV, and if it wasn't obvious, there will be spoilers for the entire game and its supplementary content, Kingsclave and Brotherhood. With that being said, strap in because this is going to be a long one, and this is my full review of Final Fantasy XV, 8 years later. I'm gonna be honest here, this is my first time playing Final Fantasy XV. Yes, it's been 8 years since the release and I've never played this game. After playing XV, I have to say, I actually really like this game. And because of that, I wanted to make this review a little more special. So I played through the entire game with all of its DLCs, watched the movie, completed the entire anime, read the novel, played the fishing VR game, and downloaded the shitty mobile game. Seriously, don't play it. It's a really bad shovelware game, and I don't recommend you go anywhere near this game with a 10 foot pole. Anyways, I consumed all of the different media that the Final Fantasy XV universe had to offer so that I could get the full context of what was happening in Final Fantasy XV because they sure did leave a lot of stuff out of the game. And don't worry, I'm not going to go over the VR and mobile games because they basically don't have any relevant story to the game, so rest assured. Anyway, let's get into the review. Final Fantasy XV takes place in the modern fantasy setting of Eos. Eos is divided into four nations, Lucius, Tenebrae, Accordio, and Niflheim. 
Niflheim, being the warmongering empire that they are, conquered Tenebrae and Accordio with numerous attempts to take Lucius. The only reason Lucius still stands is because of the crystal that the king holds, which allows him to create a barrier to protect the crown city of Insomnia. But unfortunately, Lucius's days of protection are numbered due to the king's failing health, so he agrees to an armistice with Niflheim by offering his son Noctis to a political marriage with Luna Freya. And this is where the story starts. The title screen opens up with this beautiful main theme song that legitimately gave me the chills listening to it for the first time. This song makes use of these powerful violin and piano chords to evoke a sense of somberness and tragedy with a small sliver of hope in there, and it perfectly mirrors the sadness of the events that take place in the game. And this is a perfect way to set the tone of the story of 15 while also becoming one of my most favorite main title themes. The music composer of Final Fantasy XV, Yoko Shimomura, who's been making music in the gaming industry for 35 years now, and was involved with the soundtracks of the Kingdom Hearts games, did an absolutely amazing job with this soundtrack. The music in this game is breathtaking and quickly became one of my most favorite Final Fantasy soundtracks ever. Back to the game now. The events of Noctis' journey take place right after the movie Kingsglaive where King Regis sends Luna Freya to Altitia in order to deliver the Ring of Lelucii to Noctis and marry him in order to bring peace between the Kingdom of Insomnia and the Empire of Niflheim. The game opens up with a cutscene that takes place right before the events of King's Glaive. In this cutscene, King Regis is sending Noctis off to be wed to Luna Freya in a really heartfelt father and son moment, and it's actually kind of refreshing to see that King Regis genuinely cares about his son, because the kings in Mida are usually depicted as authoritative and aloof towards their children so that they can become worthy successors to the throne. It's an old and tired trope at this point, and I'm glad that they made King Regis actually attempt to be a good father because it's a refreshing take on how royalty is depicted in media. We start off our road trip with the crew stranded in the middle of a desert highway, pushing their car because it runs out of gas. The boys are bickering and bantering while they're pushing the car, and it's a perfect way to quickly establish the relationship between these guys without having us to give us the whole backstory. We eventually make it to Hammerhead, where we meet our mechanic Cindy, and I gotta say, the character designs in Final Fantasy XV are really good. I'm being completely serious here. Final Fantasy games always had some great character designs, and 15 is no different. The main character artist Tetsuya Nomura never ceases to amaze me with his endless creative talent for the games he's involved in. Pretty much every character in this game had a really memorable look, and it's what really helped sell this game into marketing. Anyway, Cindy gives us the quest to kill some monsters in the area, and this would serve as the tutorial for the combat of the game. The combat is admittedly quite simple but it's extremely varied. You have all your standard combat stuff, like an attack button, an item button, a block button, things you would generally find in any combat nowadays, and it's pretty serviceable here, nothing too mind-blowing. But the complexity comes in the amount of variations you can have within your loadout. You have four weapon slots that you can bring with you into battle, and in these slots, you can equip a different weapon that you can switch between seamlessly in combat. Now the great part about this is that there's so many different kinds of weapons that Noctis can equip. He's legitimately a jack of all trades, and it's so fun slicing through your weapons in the middle of a combo while you're beating up demons. Your attacks are also based on the direction you're holding when you press the attack button. So for example, if you hold forward while you attack, you'll do a strike that moves you forward. If you hold backwards, you'll strike and dash back. Admittedly, it took me a while to figure this out because this game doesn't really do a good job at explaining small mechanics like this. There's also this really extensive skill tree system called Ascendancy, which you can use your skill points to gain a variety of passive and active skills for Noctis and the crew. This is actually a pretty decent skill system as it allows you to acquire some really cool techniques for you and your party members. Also, for some reason, the elemental spells are a consumable item and they do friendly fire damage to you and your teammates which is kind of an odd design decision to make. There's also a problem with the camera because it's pretty awful in enclosed spaces. Whenever you try to fight an enemy inside a cave or a small room, the camera just completely spazzes out half the time and I'm just here like, I would like to see the enemy please. But I digress. 
So after we kill some monsters, we head back to Cindy and she fixes the regalo for us and now we can finally go on a road trip with the boys. And while at first driving the regalia is kind of cool, the fun quickly fades away when you realize the car doesn't go that fast and it can't drive off the road unless you get the upgrade. So you're basically driving the same as the autopilot. Yeah, it's pretty lame. It's also kind of weird why they made driving so time consuming. Because if you want to get to your quest location and you don't have the fast travel spot unlocked there, You'll literally have to sit AFK and stare at your screen for 5 to 10 minutes until you get there. The thing about traveling in open world video games is that the act of moving from point A to point B is not really that interesting. So that's why games try to make the experience better by adding a bunch of side activities off the beaten path or by giving you multiple tools to traverse the world. Final Fantasy XV doesn't really do this that well because although the world is really beautiful looking, there isn't really that much to fill it, making it feel pretty empty. So most of the time I'm just sitting in the car waiting to get my next destination because there was just nothing to do. At this point the game opens up to us and we're now able to explore the open world and take on side quests. Unfortunately though the side quest design in this game is pretty dated. Like most of them are just go to this place and kill x things or get y thing and then return to quest giver. And the voice acting for the side quest NPCs feels so flat. It felt like the voice actors were bored when they did these. I mean, I would be too if I had to give out these side quests. Like, one side quest is just to go find some frogs. That's it. And the hunts aren't really any better either. They just go kill X mobs in this area at a specific time of day. Which is fine, I don't really mind this that much. But tell me why when you go turn in these hunts, you have to sit through the 15 second completion animation for each hunt. Since I like to complete them in batches, I would often turn in 5 to 10 hunts at a time. And when I turn them in, it would take several minutes just to go through all of them because it does the hunt completed animation then it just sits there on the screen for an annoyingly long time. I don't know, I just can't help shake the feeling that this game tries to take up as much of your time as possible. There's this quote by a certain famous streamer, Video games should not make you feel like you're wasting your time. They should make you want to waste your time. And sometimes I think this quote applies to FF15 because a lot of the time I felt like it was trying to waste my time with all these long animations you have to sit through, like the completion animation, the regalia travel, etc. Don't get me wrong, I still enjoyed this game, but I felt like it tried too hard to keep me playing. Anyways, we go to the Golden Key and we meet Arden. I'll talk about him later, but for now he's just a suspicious looking guy. This area is where I discovered the fishing mechanic, which is actually really well made. Like, there's a whole entire fishing minigame that comes with a plethora of fish species that only spawn in certain regions and certain times of day. You also have a fishing rod that you can upgrade in order to catch bigger fish, and it's actually pretty impressive how much depth there is to this fishing minigame. That's probably why they made a whole fishing VR spin-off game out of this. Also, while we're on the topic of side activities, Every end game day Prompto takes pictures of your adventures and it's actually really cool how they made it seem so natural while also making it unique to you. After meeting Arden, we then rest for the night at the Golden Key and then we get this really abrupt and out of place animation of Insomnia Falling which was pulled straight from the Kingsglaive movie but without the audio and it was just kind of jarring that they chose to do the revelation like this. The following day Noctis gets the news and he's visibly distraught so he decides to go back to Insomnia and see for himself if it's true and sure enough it is. We then get a call from the Crown Garden Marshal Corps to meet up at Hammerhead in order to tell Noctis that he has to become the next king of Lucius. And that ends chapter 1. We start chapter 2 by heading to Hammerhead to meet up with Kor only to find out that he's not there and we have to meet him at some secret location. So I did what anyone else would do. I went and did some side quests for an hour and a half before meeting him. We eventually get to the royal tomb that Kor is at and he tells Noctis that it's his duty as the next king to collect all the royal arms. So we collect the first one and he tells us there's 13 of them 
and there's another one that happens to be laying around some nearby dungeon. So we head into the dungeon to retrieve the royal arm. The dungeon itself is a pretty neat introduction to how dungeons work in 15 and was quite fun to go through. And after we get the royal arm, we attack an imperial blockade where we run into Loki, some random imperial general, and we end up having to fight him. As soon as the battle starts, he launches a barrage of missiles at me and immediately one-shots me. Now, this would be annoying if I actually died from this, but this game is really easy, and if you stock up on resources properly, you'll never hit the game over screen, even if the monsters are way over your level and are one-shotting you. Whenever you go down, you go into an incapacitated state where you will start to lose max HP over time. If your max HP hits zero, then it's game over. The thing about this is, if you have enough elixirs and consumables, you can keep restoring your max HP every time you go down, and you'll never lose. I guess it works for the more casual target audience that the developers were going for. Anyway, we kick Loki's ass and after the battle, Kord tells us that he's no longer worried about us and he has full faith in Noctis fulfilling his destiny. He leaves us to our own devices and we unlock a new area of the open world to end off chapter 2. We begin chapter 3 with a menacing cutscene introducing the higher ranking commanders of Niflheim. Again, the character designs of the villains are great. The camera goes back to Noctis, and he gets a call from Gladio's little sister Iris, telling us he needs to meet her at Listalum. Gladio, being the protective brother that he is, wants to meet up with her immediately. But, there are a bunch of side quests laying around, and I ended up taking my sweet time getting to Listalum. I even did a really cool side quest where I had to track down a behemoth looking monster that ends with a really cool fight with it. I would have really preferred it much more if there were less filler side quests and more engaging ones like this one. But sadly it seems like this quest was the only one that was this well made, and that's because it was used as gameplay trailer footage. We eventually arrive at Lestalem and meet up with Iris and have a little chat with her about the destruction of the Crown City, and after that we go to bed and collect our XP. I want to comment on how 15 tries to add an element of realism to the game, and I think it treads a very thin line between what's fun and what's realistic. There are a lot of gameplay design aspects that were made with the intent of immersing the player, like having to refuel the regalia every so often, having to sit through long car rides, needing to rest in order to level up, etc. Although these things don't exactly make the gameplay better per se, they do add a level of immersion that's so much better for the people who really enjoy immersing themselves in the world of EOS. Anyway, we go on a little date with Iris, and it's obvious that she has a crush on Noctis, but the game never really reveals why. The Brotherhood anime touches upon this a bit. Way back when they were both kids, Iris went to the royal castle because she wanted to see Noctis for some reason. While waiting around to see him, something catches her eye and she wanders off and gets lost in the massive royal garden. Everyone in the castle notices she's missing and panic starts to set in. Night falls and Iris starts to get really scared, but Noctis eventually finds her not long after and brings her back to safety. She then gets scolded for wandering off on her own, but Noctis decides to take the blame for her and gets punished for it. And after seeing how selfless Noctis was, Iris starts to develop a little crush on him and has had it ever since. After our date with Iris, we're told that there's another royal arm in a dungeon behind a massive waterfall. So I did what any other normal person would do. I run a bunch of random side quests for the next 3 hours. Before I head off for the waterfall dungeon, I rest at a motel and we get this really heartfelt one on one conversation with Prompto. And this dialogue was actually really endearing and it made a lot of references to the Brotherhood anime. Like how they've known each other since elementary school but Prompto was too shy to talk to Noctis then. You see, Prompto wasn't always the happy-go-lucky jokester that we travel with. He was actually quite the opposite actually. In the anime, Kid Prompto was super shy and didn't really fit in with the other kids. He was also a bit bigger. This is important, trust me. Kid Prompto had attempted to talk to Noctis numerous times because he wanted to be friends with him, but always got cold feet at the last second. Until one day when he finally mustered up the courage to do so, he tripped and fell in front of Noctis. And when Noctis tried to pull him up, he calls Prompto heavy. Prompto took the hint and made it his goal to lose weight in order to befriend Noctis. So he starts exercising every day and tries to better his social skills in order to not only become more approachable to people, but to become someone that he can be proud of. 
Prompto goes on the Sigma male grind set for years until high school where he's completely done a 180 and finally has the confidence to talk to Noctis and ever since then they've become the best of friends. With this knowledge, it made this rooftop scene much more personal and contextualize what Prompto is feeling in this moment because Gladio and Ignis felt a bit lacking in the backstory department. But I digress, after the rooftop scene, we'll eventually make our way to the dungeon behind the waterfall and get to the next royal arm. Which, funny enough, you don't need to collect all of them in order to beat the game. Which I found kinda odd because it's kinda Noctis' mission to collect all of the royal arms and save the world from the darkness, but you don't actually need to collect all of them. Which is really weird. Anyway, once we get the royal armament, Noctis starts getting these weird visions accompanied by massive migraines, and we return to Lostal in order to figure out what's up with them. And so, ends chapter 3. In chapter 4, we finally go with Arden to see what the source of the visions are, after about 5 hours of side questing of course. We then get to the source of the visions, and it turns out that our angry boy Titan was the source of it. The crew gets separated from a landslide and it's only Noctis and Gladio for this section. After a couple minutes of walking, Noctis starts complaining and it somehow pissed Gladio off, who then proceeds to basically tell Noctis to shut up. And then he opens up about how his family line is the King's Sworn Shield and that he'll always be there for Noctis when he falters. This is some pretty nice dialogue that gives us some introspection to Gladio's background, but they never really explored this any further and it's kinda disappointing that they don't go deeper into Gladio's past. After that we talked to Titan and told him to stop with the visions, but he didn't like that and gets big mad, and now we have to throw hands with him for a bit. I wanna say I do like the designs of the gods in this game and how absolutely massive they are. It gives me the sense that they're more godly than how they're usually depicted in other Final Fantasies. After our little scuffle with Titan, we defeat him, then the land around him starts crumbling. Arden then shows up in his ship and formally introduces himself as the Chancellor of the Empire and the group is taken aback, which is kinda weird if you think about it. You'd think that they would know who the Chancellor of the Empire that destroyed their home is, but whatever, I'll let this slide. The gang ends up having to hop on Arden's ship in order to avoid impending doom, and that ends chapter 4. In chapter 5, we start off with the gang stranded once again without a car. It turns out the Empire stole the regalia after he fought Titan, so now we have to travel using chocobos. The messenger of the gods Gentiana then appears in front of us telling Noctis that he has to acquire the powers of... Rama? First Titan, now Rama. Excuse me, what? You mean Ramu? I would expect that they at least pronounce the names correctly in the English voice acting. Anyway, we need to touch these three stones of Ramu in order to get his powers. The first two are easy to get, but the third one is in a pretty easy dungeon a couple miles away. Disappointingly enough, we don't have to fight Ramu in order to get his power, he just kinda gives it to us. Which is kinda odd because you have to fight the other gods for the powers, why not Ramu's? Also, it's kinda weird how summons work in this game. I don't think it was ever explained properly what the conditions were for summoning. It seems like you just randomly get the ability to summon during battle and it's just kinda weird how they obscured this information from the player. Whatever. After we get the power and exit the cave, we get a call from Sydney telling us that she found a regalia inside an imperial base. Cool, we can finally get our regalia back in a half-baked stealth section. Look, I'm gonna be honest, I don't think games that aren't designed for stealth should have it whatsoever. The stealth in this game is pretty bad, the enemy AI is stupid, you only have one way to take down enemies, you can't properly hide behind objects, it's just not good. Anyway, we stealth into the base and take out their shields stealthily. After clearing out the enemies, we had to reclaim our regalia, but when we get there, we encounter General Ravis of the Imperial Army. He then proceeds to kick the shit out of us and roasts Gladio that he's a weak protector. Luckily though, Arden steps in before he can escalate and we go our separate ways. We head back to Lestalum, but before that, we take a slight detour and do the Final Fantasy XIV collaboration quest. And I gotta say, this collaboration quest is really well done. They've managed to include a bunch of game design elements from 14, like the enemies, the boss mechanics, and the music. And as someone who's played a lot of 14, this put a really big smile on my face the entire time. 
The quest even ends off on a really cool Gerudo boss fight for 14. I just love how well done this quest was in general and how true they kept it to the original source material. However, the Terror Battle collab quest wasn't as good though, but it was still a nice change of pace. After we get our car back, we head back to Lestalem to find out the Empire paid a visit while we were out and killed Talcott's grandpa. Everyone is obviously distraught after this, and this is where the group collectively resolves to do something about it, and thus ends chapter 5. Chapter 6 opens with a weird dream from the Omen trailer that was released 6 years ago as a what if scenario if Noctis went on his journey alone without his companions. And yeah, this is really foreboding for Noctis, but the thing is, this dream is never really referenced again. And it just kind of feels like they need to shoehorn this trailer in so that the animators didn't feel like they wasted their effort. After Noctis wakes up from the dream, we head to Cape Kaim in order to set sail for Atisha. But before we do that, the gang decides to take the Empire down a peg or two and destroy a couple of their bases. We infiltrate their base in order to track down another Imperial General, Caligo. And yet again, we have to do another forced, awful stealth section. We eventually subdue him and destroy the generator for the base, and as we're leaving, we get ambushed by an Imperial mercenary who is none other than Aranea. And I gotta say, I really like her design. Aranea is so badass. She quickly became one of my favorite side characters in this game. I only wish that she had a bigger role in the story because she doesn't really get that much screen time. Anyway, after our little scuffle with Aranea, she gets away, and we head back to our car and resume our journey to Cape Kayam. We eventually make it there after a small detour for a royal arm with Iris joining us, and it's really unfortunate that this is the only time Iris joins the party. I really wish that they would have utilized guest party members more often. When we get to Cape Kayam, Gladio asks us to leave the party so that he can go on a solo mission. I'll talk more about that in episode Gladio, but this ends chapter 6. In chapter 7, the gang without Gladio had to stay lift Grove because we need some materials for our boat that's supposed to take us to Altitia. On our way there, we meet with Arden and the Empire because they're after the same materials as we are. As we enter the dungeon, Aranea joins us for the duration of it and she's absolutely awesome and kicks some major ass in there. In the dungeon, she discusses her discontent with the Empire and how she was hired under false pretenses. This would later plant the seed for what she does later in the story. After we got what we came for, we exit the dungeon and Aranea takes us back to Lestalem. And that ends the short chapter 7. We begin chapter 8 with an urgent mission from the Lestalem power plant manager, Holly, telling us that the power plant's been taken over by demons. But in order to take out the demons, we need to put on a full radiation suit, and there is only one around. So Noctis suits up and heads into the power plant to take out the demons. When we enter the plant, we're accompanied by a mysterious individual. I wonder who could it be? After we clear the demons, Holly is able to use the plant again and give us our mithril, and surprise, Gladio comes back to us. Turns out, he was the mysterious stranger that accompanied us. Who could have guessed? Now that we have the mithril, we can head back to Cape Kaim and deliver it to Cindy. But before we do that, we go in a maze-like sewer dungeon in order to get some parts for the regalia to make it drive off-road. This is the point in the game where the dungeons start to become more maze-like and confusing in layout. And I'm not really a fan of their philosophy on how they do late game dungeons because instead of making the layout intuitive on where to go, they make it obscure by creating multiple paths that lead to dead ends and it just makes the dungeon a slog to go through. Anyway, we make it out of the dungeon with the parts and deliver it to Cindy, and now she's able to make the Regalia Type D, a version of the Regalia that's able to drive off road. I also want to say that I really like how much customization you have with the Regalia. You can add the calls, change paint colors, change the wheels, etc. You can even upgrade it to do a bunch of really cool things, and it's pretty clear that the developers put a lot of thought into how players can customize their experience. After we get a new ride, we go do some more side quests, like the really random cup noodle collaboration quest. After a few hours of side questing, we head back to Cape Kayam and finally board the boat to Altitia. And that ends chapter 8. Chapter 9 we arrive at Altitia and the city is absolutely massive. I immediately got lost trying to find my way to the next quest point. 
Not only that, but Alticia looks amazingly beautiful, taking loads of inspiration from the real life city of Venice. One thing Final Fantasy XV does right is the world design because the world is just amazing to look at. The themes and inspirations that many parts of the game draw from are on full display here. Many times while I was exploring, I would just stop for a moment to just take in the sights and smell the flowers. The devs even knew this game looked amazing too because they gave you the ability to take pictures of the environment. The artists did an amazing job here and I commend them for their masterful talent at this game. So we finally make our way to the bar and we meet with Camellia, the secretary of Alticia. Here we discuss Alticia's political affairs with the ritual to the god Leviathan that Luna Freya is about to conduct for Noctis to receive the blessing. And we have to do this multiple choice dialogue scene, which is pretty hard to fail because the choices are pretty obvious as to which are the right answers and which are the wrong answers. The dialogue choices in this game always boil down to either being nice or being a dick. And obviously being nice is always the answer if you want the good ending. I'm not saying I want Witcher 3 levels of dialogue choices, but I would've liked it if they at least tried to make it not as obvious. Anyway, we went over the trust of Camellia and she reveals that the Empire will attack during the ritual. After the meeting, we make our preparations to defend the ritual from the Imperial Vaders in a full scale battle. Luna Freya then starts the ritual to summon Leviathan, and as predicted, the Empire attacks. While Luna Freya is struggling to commune with Leviathan, Noctis is defending the city from Imperial invaders. We then get this really cool set piece moment where we climb onto Leviathan in order to request for her power, but she is not too fond of us. Leviathan then begins to raise the city in a fit of rage, and we get this pretty cool gameplay segment where we have to avoid her attacks. Leviathan eventually gets a hit on Noctis and knocks him unconscious. Get it? Anyway, eventually Arden shows up to cause chaos, so he appears next to Luna Freya and stabs her, then he dips out of there. Luna Freya, being mortally wounded, spends her last dying breath to conjure the power of the kings and bestows it upon Noctis, giving him Super Saiyan-like abilities. We then get this pretty cool gameplay moment where Noctis is going Super Saiyan and kicks the shit out of Leviathan. My only complaints for this boss fight was that it was way too easy and it eventually does get dragged out and overstay its welcome a bit. He's then taken to a dream where he talks to Luna Freya one last time before she finally passes away from her wounds, not before giving him the ring of the Lucii. The cutscene that accompanies this moment is extremely emotional and amazingly animated. The emotions on Noctis' face as he desperately tries to reach out to Luna as she sinks deeper into the water is so well done. But I did have one problem with this cutscene, and it's that it could have hit so much harder if Luna Freya had much more presence in this game. You see, Chapter 9 is really the only time she makes an appearance in this story and does really anything, and in the other times, she only makes brief appearances and flashbacks, not really giving enough screen time for us to really connect with her. She did, however, have a lot of screen time in the Kingsglaive movie, but unfortunately she doesn't do anything in there either. I feel like her character was just a massively missed opportunity to create someone that the audience can relate to and care about. After that emotional cutscene, Noctis wakes up to find that Ignis has lost his sight and Aluna has passed away. He's obviously very distraught and broken up about this because the love of his life is dead, but I just don't find the relationship believable. They never really had any chemistry on screen other than I want to marry you and knowing each other since childhood. Hell, Noctis has more chemistry with Iris than Luna Freya. She would have made for a way more believable love interest than what we get with Noctis and Luna being together. But I digress. After Noctis wakes up, the gang decides to leave Alticia and make way for the Imperial Continent. So ends Chapter 9. This is the point where the tone of the game massively shifts to a more somber feeling to represent the sadness that Noctis is going through. We start off Chapter 10 weeks later after the events of Chapter 9 on a train headed for the Imperial capital and Noctis is still heartbroken over Luna. Gladio gets pissed off and tells him to get over it because he's got a duty as king and he needs to move on. Obviously Noctis doesn't take this too well and lashes back at Gladio and they get into a fight. This is the point in the story where there's a schism in the group and the story takes a more serious turn. There's no more playful banter and no more silly antics. You can just feel the tension throughout this part of the game. Anyway, we get off the train at Cartanica for the next royal arm that's hidden in some abandoned quarry. For this part, since Ignis is blind, we're essentially down a man and we'll have to escort him throughout the dungeon. 
I also like in combat how they made Ignis actually fight like, well, a blind person. It's a nice little attention to detail that the developers didn't have to do. Anyway, after we make our way through the dungeon, we defeat the boss and get the royal arm. It's then when Ignis stops the guys and opens up to them about his true feelings on the current state of the group and how his blindness isn't getting any better. Despite being blind, Ignis wishes to stay with the group until the very end, and everyone reluctantly agrees. This also closes up the tension between the guys and brings them closer. And with that, they head back to the train and that ends chapter 10. The chapters from here on out are going to be much shorter and much more linear, and it's probably due to the development team running out of time, so they had to crunch everything within these last few chapters. Chapter 11 starts off with the gang on the train discussing a rumor they heard about the nights getting longer. And this turned out to be true, the nights were indeed getting longer. It even affected the day-night cycle way before this point in the story, and I thought that was a really cool attention to detail. A little bit after the discussion, Arden shows up on the train along with an Imperial Assault. Noctis and the gang defend the train from Imperial soldiers in a pretty cool combat segment where we have to take down Imperial ships. After destroying the Imperial fleet, Noctis finds Arden holding Prompto at gunpoint. He then warps in and pushes who he thinks is Arden off the train. But it turns out Arden swapped their looks and Noctis had pushed Prompto off the train instead. Arden then proceeds to knock Noctis out with a really janky looking hit. And this ends chapter 11. Chapter 12 starts with Noctis waking up on top of the train headed to Tenebrae. He gets a call from Ignis to meet up, but before that we have to take care of the demons on top of the train. After a bit of fighting, they decide to overwhelm Noctis, but then Leviathan comes in to save the day and wipes the demons off the train. We eventually arrive at Tenebrae and we see Aranea again who has since defected from the Empire and is now helping us out. He takes the refugees on the train and it introduces us to Biggs and Wedge who finally make their cameo in this game like they do in every Final Fantasy. After talking to a few people, the gang reboard the train and make their way towards the Imperial capital. The train eventually hits a roadblock with a few demons and we take care of them. But when we reboard the train, there's a freezing blizzard inside of it. The guys on the train get frozen solid and Noctis is barely hanging on. It's then when Gentiana emerges from the blizzard and approaches us. She then reveals her true form to be none other than the goddess Shiva herself. We then get another really emotional cutscene with Luna Freya where she laments that she couldn't spend more time with Noctis. This is when Gentiana promises to give her powers to Noctis and fulfill her role as a messenger of the gods. And I gotta say, they really knock it out of the park with the voice acting of these cutscenes. They perfectly carry the weight of the emotions that the characters are feeling in that moment and it just makes these scenes hit that much harder. And the music that plays during these tear-jerking scenes are just masterful pieces of art. Once again, bravo to the music design team for this amazing soundtrack. After we get that flashback, Shiva gives her power to Noctis and we get yet another emotional scene with Noctis this time. Noctis gets up as he wipes the tears off his face and Arden approaches us menacingly telling us where Prompto is. Then he disappears leaving a foreboding conclusion to chapter 12. Now chapter 13 is probably the worst chapter gameplay wise. Chapter starts off with a bunch of demons overwhelming the train. The gang escape the demons and hop into the regalia, starting a race against the clock sequence with the empire bombarding us. The regalia eventually takes too much damage and can no longer operate. So we have to continue forward to the imperial capital leaving the regalia behind. Probably the saddest death in the game. The group moves forward without the car, but a train falls over and separates Noctis from the group. Noctis, being determined with his mission, moves ahead alone. And as the demons ambush him, Noctis discovers that Arden has taken his weapons away. So in a spur of desperation, Noctis puts on the Ring of the Lucia and gets to use his powers. Now this is probably the most boring section of the game because the powers of the ring are boring. In order to kill enemies, you have to stand still and hold the button until they die. That's it. How did the developers think that this would be fun? Not only that, but the level design just becomes super linear with long and narrow hallways. Everything about this section onward just feels rushed. So I switched over to Gladio and Ignis' section, and while their gameplay was a little more fun, this whole chapter still felt rushed. Even the polish and the dialogue seemed to go down in quality. I 
I can't hear it anymore. Is it dead? No, dear. You just disappeared. You've never seen one that talked like that before. I fixated on the crystal. The thought our Aeneas that the demons were it afraid may be of the crystal. Flame. Or it may be one of the Empire's alternative facts. Or whichever it is, that monster's still on the loose. We need to find it before it finds no right. temple. Noctis eventually meets back up with the group, and they both go rescue Prompto from captivity. We'll discuss how Prompto ends up there in the episode Prompto section. A little while later, Prompto reveals to the group that he was born in Niflheim and that he doesn't deserve to be with everyone because he's not like them. But despite his origins, the guy still accepts him for who he is. This scene was really heartwarming and shed some light on how Prompto always suffered from imposter syndrome, even more so after the revelations in episode Prompto. We then find the device sealing away Noctis' powers and destroy it. After that, we make our way to the hangar, only to find General Ravis corrupted by Arden when we get there. Unfortunately, he's not himself and begs us to end him. So we have to put down the fallen Ravis, and after that, we immediately get swarmed by demons. The group then tells Noctis that they can hold back the swarm long enough for him to go get the crystal alone. Noctis reluctantly agrees to go alone and receive the crystal's power. But when he tries to receive the power, he gets absorbed into the crystal. And as Noctis is being absorbed into the crystal, Arden shows up and reveals that he was supposed to be the first king of Lucis. But everything was taken from him by his brother, or Noctis' ancestor, Somnus. While Noctis is in the crystal, he talks to Bahamut. And I actually really like this version of Bahamut because his design is actually pretty cool. Usually he is depicted as a raging dragon of destruction in other Final Fantasy games, but in 15 he's more regal and benevolent. His design was also changed to be a really big suit of armor with swords for wings and it's just really badass looking. During the talk with Bahamut, he reveals to Noctis that in order to rid the world of darkness, Noctis must give away his life to save everyone. And so with that in mind, Noctis accepts his fate and takes the mantle as the savior of the world. After that, he finally finishes receiving the crystal's power and wakes up in Angel Guard 10 years later, thus ending chapter 13. Chapter 14 starts off with the older, more mellow Noctis heading back to Hammerhead. But once he arrives, he realizes that in the 10 years that he was gone, the world was engulfed by darkness and because of that, demons run rampant throughout the world. I really like the atmosphere of the bleak and hopeless world that they've set up here. There are monsters roaming once safe areas, it's eerily quiet because no music is playing, and not a single other person is in sight. It's a pretty interesting change of tone that they've done here. Anyways, as Noctis makes his way through the hordes of demons on his way to Hammerhead, a lone truck approaches him. The truck stops next to Noctis and lo and behold, the driver is Talcott, who is now a young man. Talcott takes Noctis to Hammerhead and explains to him what's happened to the world for the past 10 years while Noctis was gone. And it's really sobering to hear how society has deteriorated. Every city is abandoned and the crew went their separate ways. Everything here seems so grim. Once Noctis arrives at Hammerhead, he's greeted by the guys awaiting for his return after 10 long years. The music starts to play again and we start to regain some hope in what was once a hopeless situation. This is where we make our preparations for the final battle, and before the final battle, we get the final campsite scene. And this scene was just heartwarming, seeing four best friends get together after a decade of being apart, sitting around a campfire reminiscing about the good times they had together. It was bittersweet, but comforting at the same time to watch the boys hang out with each other one last time. After this, the group donned their crowns guard attire as they head back to Insomnia so Noctis can reclaim his throne as rightful king. As the group makes their way through the city, they fight off hordes of demons and infest it, and not long after, they encounter Kor who is still alive alongside the king's glaive. Kor introduces us to the base of operations where there are side quests to get some really good gear for the guys. Once we take the quest, we exit the underground subway to encounter Arden, who then summons demons to rain down from the sky all over Insomnia and erects a rather suspiciously phallic looking barrier around the Crown Citadel. He then disappears to the throne to await our arrival. This is where we get to free roam around Insomnia, which is a new dungeon included in the Royal Edition, and this dungeon is absolutely huge. 
It's nice that the developers gave us an area where we can spend our time before the final boss fight, because a major complaint for the base version was that the last few levels were far too linear and players wanted to spend more time in the world. So this was a nice addition to the game, although a little bit light on content. After doing the side quest, we head for the citadel which is being guarded by a Cerberus. We eventually put down the guard dog, but we still have a problem. We need to take down the barrier. That's when the spirit of Luna Freya helps us alongside all of the gods we've encountered so far, and they destroy the barrier to the citadel. Once we get to the steps of the citadel, we encounter Ifrit, who stands in our way. We fight him as well, and with the help of Bahamut, we defeat Ifrit, allowing us to enter the citadel. What comes next is a gauntlet of battles against the previous kings that Arden was somehow able to mind control. One by one, we're able to take them all down and head to the throne room. And right before we enter the throne room, we're able to choose a picture of our liking to take with us. And I love this. It's up to you whether you want to make the final cutscene really sad or really funny. I chose the sad route because I wanted to experience the game the way developers intended for us. We enter the throne room and sure enough, there's Arden sitting on our chair. Arden then knocks out our party members and challenges us to a one-on-one -on -one duel to the death outside. We then fight Arden in a pretty decent boss fight. I'm not saying this was amazing by any standards, but it provided a pretty good spectacle as we're zipping around the city Dragon Ball Z style in a huge anime fight. After battling Arden for a while, Noctis is able to get the upper hand and defeat Arden, finally putting him down. A cutscene then plays after that where Noctis is finally able to reclaim his throne. And as he sits on it, he says his final goodbyes as he summons the kings of Lucis to grant him the power to rid the world of darkness. This scene was probably the most depressing scene in the entire game. Noctis desperately clings for his life as we see each of the kings gather within him, his strength slowly fading away from his physical body with each strike, until finally, his father's sword gives the final strike to Noctis, sending him to the afterlife. And in the afterlife, Noctis uses his power of the kings to destroy Arden's spirit and rid him from the world once and for all, bringing light back to Eos. With that, Noctis has finally completed his duty as king, and now he can pass away in peace. Then, the credits roll. After the credits, there's one final cutscene where it's the gang at the final campsite, and Noctis finally opens up to them in a really masterfully crafted cutscene. The facial animations of Noctis' lips quivering as he struggles to speak, the voice acting of him trying to hold back his tears as he opens up to the guys, and the impeccable atmosphere buildup. It was all one final gut punch of emotions, it was a perfect send off for the guys. The four of us around a campfire. How long's it been? Hmm. An eternity. So yeah. I, um... Out with it. I just... Is this so hard? So I... I've made my peace. Still. Knowing this is it. And seeing you here now. It's more than I can take. Yeah, you're damn right it is. Huh.
He spit it out. It's good to hear. Well, what can I say? Do you guys are the best? As well as Noctis in the afterlife as he's reunited with Luna Freya where they can finally spend the rest of eternity together. And I gotta say, this ending broke me. Journeying with Noctis and the gang for the last 30 hours or so and seeing him grow as a character, seeing him go through tragedy after tragedy as he's forced to keep moving forward, not even being given any time to grieve. All Noctis wanted in life was to be happy. But it seems like fate has denied him that, and it's only in death where he can finally find happiness. It's a bittersweet ending to Noctis' story, but because of that, it was much more impactful. Although the base game of Final Fantasy is complete, it still has 5 DLCs that were released, and this is the section I'm going to be going over all the DLCs for Final Fantasy XV. First, we'll start off with Episode Gladiolus. Now, this DLC is relatively low stakes compared to the rest of them, and kinda just serves as a decent little side romp for an hour or so. Gladio's DLC takes place after he leaves the party for a bit to go off on a solo mission at the end of chapter 6. The reason why Gladio wanted to go off on his own was because after he got his ass handed to him by General Ravis, Gladio wanted to search for more power so that he could protect Noctis better. He calls up Kor to accompany him, then they both go to the ancient temple grounds where the legendary swordsman Gilgamesh resides. The dungeon itself is alright, it's just a typical linear dungeon with monsters every so often, and Gladio's gameplay is a bit too simple, but it kinda works for the scope of this DLC anyway. As we go through the temple grounds, we learned that Kor attempted to do this very same dungeon a long time ago with a couple of comrades. But they weren't strong enough to beat Gilgamesh, so he was then defeated and his friends were slain, leaving Kor to flee with his tail between his legs. Kor's story gives us a sense of how strong Gilgamesh is, and he's quite powerful. Anyway, we go through the dungeon trials, which are just reused demon enemies repurposed as bosses. After the trials, we get to fight Gilgamesh in a 1-on-1 -on -one fight, and the boss itself is pretty decent. He's not too difficult, and he has a good variety of attacks and phases to shake up the fight a little bit. After we beat Gilgamesh, he bestows Gladio a really cool looking katana. Gladio takes the katana, then leaves the temple grounds with his newfound power and returns back to the guys. Overall, this DLC was short and sweet. It didn't overstay its welcome and it didn't try too much. It just wanted to explain what Gladio was doing while he was gone. And it did exactly that, so this DLC was pretty decent. Although I feel like they could have used this DLC to go into the backstory of Gladio, what makes him the person he is, because it's never really delved into in the anime, and I feel like that's just kind of a missed opportunity for this character. Now on to episode Prompto, and this DLC is probably the best one out of all of them. The storytelling, the gameplay, the sheer scope of this DLC was so much better than all the other ones. Immediately, we can see that this DLC has a much more serious tone, which is very different to what people were expecting with Prompto's episode, because he's usually a happy-go-lucky jokester. But in this DLC, he doesn't crack any jokes, nor does he smile at all, and this tonal shift represents the gravity of the situation. Episode Prompto takes place after Noctis pushes him off the train in Chapter 11. The DLC starts with him wandering the endless frozen tundra, slowly losing the energy to live. He then falls unconscious, and luckily, or unluckily, the Empire rescues him from the frozen wasteland. He then wakes up in his cell, and Arden shows up to give Prompto his gun, also opening a door for Prompto to escape. 
Now we're actually able to play the game, and Prompto plays a lot differently than the others because he uses guns instead of melee weapons. And his gameplay is actually pretty fun. It basically plays as an action third person shooter game. He has multiple guns he can swap through, like a submachine gun, a rocket launcher, a sniper, and he can steal these guns off the enemies so you'll never have to worry about ammo. Prompto's gameplay was just loads of fun. Anyway, as we're blasting through waves of Magitech soldiers, we eventually escape the base and the game gives us a snowmobile to explore the semi-open world with. There are even side quests for this DLC and you can even upgrade your snowmobile for some reason even though you're only going to be using it for another half an hour. As we play through this episode, we go through the journey of Prompto finding out about his origins and where he came from. And when he finally finds out his origins, he's understandably in a state of remorse because that would confirm his imposter syndrome that he's always felt with the guys. But luckily Aranea who joins Prompto on his adventure whips him into shape. And now Prompto is determined and he's ready to keep moving forward and finish what he started. After fighting through the base, we then get to the end where we have to fight a giant mechanical worm in an on rail shooting section. And I'm not really a fan of this part. This section was such a huge contrast to the Final Fantasy combat that I thought I was playing Call of Duty for a second. Anyway, after we defeat the mechanical worm, we escape the Imperial base and this ends episode Prompto. This DLC was actually really good. Just about everything that it did made it stand out from the rest of them. The story that it tells, the sheer size of it, the excellent writing. This DLC did way more than what it needed to and it was amazing because of it. Next we have episode Ignis which is also a pretty good DLC. This episode takes place during the events of chapter 9 when Leviathan attacks Altitia. While Noctis was fighting off Leviathan, Ignis and the other guys all spread out to defend the city from Imperial forces. The gameplay for this DLC is pretty simple, but it still manages to be quite a bit of fun. You see, Ignis uses elemental daggers that you can swap through seamlessly in combat, and each element has their own unique purpose. There's also this kind of small minigame where you have to retake sections of the city from Imperial forces. You even get a cool grapple hook to swing around with. After retaking some sections of the city, we encounter General Caligo, who sends his troops after us. After defeating Caligo's troops, Noctis defeats Leviathan and he falls unconscious. Ignis notices this and hops on a speedboat, and here we get this really cool Need for Speed chase segment where Caligo is chasing us on a ship, shooting at us, and we're just driving as fast as we can to save Noctis. We make it to land where we fight Caligo, and his fight is pretty easy. After the fight, General Ravis shows up alongside his Magitech troops. However, this is the point where Ravis rebels against the Empire and helps Ignis out to save Noctis and Luna Freya. An alliance of convenience, if you will. We fight through some more Imperial forces until we get to where Noctis' unconscious body is. This is where Ignis then sees a vision of the future where Noctis gives his life in order to save the world. Ravis, following alongside Ignis, sees the dead body of his sister and loses it. He now wants to kill Noctis because he believes that it was Noctis' fault that she died. Ignis and Ravis then fight each other in a really depressing battle. We can feel the sheer anger in Ravis' voice as he refuses to come to terms with Luna's death. And his anger is justified because he's lost everything he's cared about, even though he tried so desperately to protect it. This fight was Ravis' downward spiral of his sanity and compassion. After some fighting, Ignis then defeats Ravis, bringing him back to his senses, where he finally comes to terms with his sister's death in a really heartbreaking cutscene as she passes on to the afterlife. Arden then comes in with his troops and subdues the both of them, and he threatens to kill Noctis right then and there. Ignis, in a moment of desperation, puts on the Ring of the Lucii, which burns his eyes. Now, if you didn't watch the Kingsglaive movie, the Ring of the Lucii is a powerful artifact that bestows the user with the power of the kings. However, anyone who puts on the Ring of the Lucii who isn't Lucian royalty will be subject to a trial by the kings to determine whether the wearer is worthy of obtaining their power or not. In order to obtain this power, the wielder must have enough determination and be willing to sacrifice something for that power. In Kingsglaive, the main character Nyx sacrifices his life for the power. Here, Ignis sacrifices his eyesight. After obtaining the power, Ignis is then able to fight Arden toe to toe and he also looks really badass with his hair down. Upon being defeated, Arden then retreats and Ignis is able to take Noctis to safety. Then we get an emotional cutscene where Noctis thanks Ignis for everything he's done. 
And that marks the end of episode Ignis. What's interesting about this episode is that you can get an alternate ending in this DLC where Noctis is alive by the end of the game, which was a pretty nice little touch, although it's obviously not canon. Now onto episode Arden. This DLC delves into the backstory of why Arden is doing the things he's doing in the main story. We start off with Arden infiltrating the crown city of Insomnia with the mission of taking down the crystals that power the barrier surrounding the city. And after a little bit of exploring, he then begins his assault on the city and wreaks havoc everywhere. We then get a flashback of his past and we see a happy young Arden with the love of his life. He was chosen by the gods to heal people, he's in line to be the next king of Lucis, and he's madly in love with his soon to be betrothed. Life is great for Arden. It was then his brother Somnus, whether it's either out of spite or jealousy, accuses Arden of being a monster. He then kills his significant other, imprisons him for two millennia, and steals his rightful kingship. This guy literally took everything from Arden and branded him as the bad guy, and I can kind of sympathize with Arden here. He was villainized by the people closest to him to the point where he accepted it and became the monster that he was feared as. It's a really tragic tale of how demonizing people can push them to their breaking points and sometimes they eventually snap. Anyway, the gameplay of this DLC is probably the most fun out of all DLCs because Arden plays similar to Noctis with a few slight differences. The biggest one being the ability to demonify people. After being released from his prison in Angel Guard, he then gets taken in by Verstyle of the Imperial Army who is also holding Ifrit in captivity. A little while later, the Kingsglaive attacked Imperial base and all hell breaks loose, freeing Ifrit as well. Arden then fights Ifrit and demonifies him in order to gain the power to destroy his foes. This is the point where Arden loses it and swears vengeance on everything Somnus has built and becomes evil. After this, we're taken back to the present where Arden's attacking the city. This is where we get a pretty cool gameplay segment where we get a large open area where we can roam around and destroy things. There's a bunch of stuff you can do in this limited area. You can even buy different hats for Arden. There's also a little skill tree that Arden has where he can acquire some pretty powerful abilities. And I thought this was a nice little addition to change up the gameplay. Anyway, after we destroy enough crystal barriers, we're able to go fight King Regis and kick his ass. And I gotta say, the music that plays for this DLC is really awesome. There are even tracks by Lotus Juice in here. If you're a Persona 3 fan, you'll understand exactly how goaded this guy is. Anyway, after we beat Regis, Somnus arrives to defend the city, and I'm gonna be honest here, the fight with Somnus is pretty lame because he doesn't really do that much and his attacks are pretty easy to dodge. So after we defeat Somnus, he admits that what he did to Arden was reprehensible, but he did it because the gods told him to do so, and he asks for Arden's understanding. Understandably, Arden didn't take too kindly to this, so he tries to kill King Regis and end the royal bloodline. But before he could do that, he's stopped by Bahama and he tells Arden that it's his destiny to spread darkness all over the world and that Noctis would be the chosen one to end Arden's suffering. And to be honest, I thought this was pretty stupid that the gods created this whole world ending prophecy in order to end Elusive's bloodline and grant Arden his revenge. Unfortunately, Arden cannot defy the will of the gods and must do as the prophecy says, spreading darkness wherever he goes. And that ends episode Arden. This DLC is probably my second most favorite because it just gives an introspection to Arden's psyche and what he went through to become so maddened by revenge. This DLC in a way humanizes Arden and after playing this, I can kinda understand why he's doing the things he's doing because after everything he's been through, his motives are kinda valid. Now for the final piece of DLC for Final Fantasy XV. The multiplayer comrades. Look, I'm gonna save you some time. This DLC isn't good. You're not missing out on anything by not playing it. But for the video, I had to play it. So here we are. In comrades, you play as your own custom avatar where they play pretty much exactly how Noctis does in the main game. The story is that you play as a king's glaive during the time that Noctis was gone for 10 years and the world was overrun with demons. You meet with Libertus from the Kingsglaive movie who's leading the defense of Lestalem, humanity's last bastion of hope. Now it's up to you and your fellow glaives to defend Lestalem until Noctis returns. 
I mean, the story in this DLC is somewhat interesting, but the gameplay is really boring. You know the hunts that were in the base game? You know the ones where you have to go to X area and kill Y monster? Yeah, well, that's the entire gameplay loop here. You see, there are a bunch of areas on the map that require power in order to progress the story forward, and the only way to get the power is to run hunts. Now, some later areas require a lot of power, so in order to get it, you have to grind the same hunts over and over again, and it all just becomes so mind-numbing. Sure, it might be fun with friends, but anything is fun with friends, and you would be probably better off playing something else. Overall, this DLC isn't really worth your time. If you really want to see the story cutscenes, just watch it on YouTube, because playing this is not fun. And that's pretty much everything about Final Fantasy XV. I know I probably missed some things, but if you've made it this far, thank you so much. This video took a while to make, and this game was one wild ride. It came out the door with so much soul and has so much ambition, spanning its stories across multiple mediums, and to be fair, I think it was somewhat successful, as Final Fantasy XV would become one of the best-selling Final Fantasies ever, selling over 10 million copies on release day. But despite the endless amounts of passion that was poured into this game, it unfortunately felt rushed near the end of it. Many aspects of this game felt like it was missing polish that probably wouldn't have been there had it not been for the 15's troubled development. But despite the lack of polish, this game manages to evoke a roller coaster of emotions in me and many players. Even though this game probably won't be the best Final Fantasy to be released, it would become one of the most beloved for the lovable characters, the deep lore, and beautiful music. I really hope that Square Enix and Yoshi P can learn from the shortcomings that 15 had and improve upon them in the next installment of the Final Fantasy series, because I cannot wait for what is in store for us. Although this won't be the best Final Fantasy game for me, it still managed to make me feel attached to the characters and the world that they've built. And no matter how janky it is at times, I still loved Final Fantasy 15 because to me, it was a disaster piece.